Good evening, everyone. This is the regular meeting of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education here on Monday, May 9th, 2022 at 7 p.m. at the Downers Grove Village Hall. This meeting is being live streamed for the public and the Village of Downers Grove's YouTube channel. Melissa, we please go roll. Member Joshi. Here. Member Ellis. Here. Member Hannes. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Olchik. Here. Member Weiner. Here. Member Hughes. Here. Tonight, members of the audience will have an opportunity to provide public comment to the board later on in the agenda. The board asks anyone wishing to comment to please fill out a card and indicate the topic to be addressed. These can be placed in the basket on the table over there to my right. I have allotted 30 minutes tonight for public comment. All right, we're going to start out tonight, as, or as we always do, uh, with our flag salute. So we'd like to welcome up the Student Council of Pierce Downer School and uh, Principal Wagner. Good evening. How's everyone doing? I'm great. Right. So it seems like a, quite a long time ago that I stood up here and did my first little spotlight on Pierce Downer in my first few months of being a principal in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and I presented on what it meant to, to when I, we said we are PD. That's a slogan that I heard um, so much getting started in my principalship. And I gave you a presentation based off of what I'd heard. Uh, this evening, I'm extremely excited. Um, a better word is probably proud to share with you what I've learned it means to be, to be PD. Uh, so this evening, we're gonna talk about being positively PD, what we've done this year to really embrace the happiness advantage. We have some amazing student council students here to talk about all the great work that they've done uh, throughout the year and even at the end of last year. We have parents that represent Pierce Downers PTA as well as our play, uh, play at Pierce committee. And then kind of rounding out what that PD pride um, really is. So to get started, please recognize this is just a small glimpse into some of the things we're doing, but I hope it gives you a good representation of the goals we have at Pierce Downer. Um, the first thing that we started at the end of last year was the Pierce Downer Cup. We recognized if we're really going to prioritize happiness, happiness can certainly come from showing gratitude towards others. So it started with me giving it to one person, and then that person was responsible for actually um, nominating the next person to give it to. Um, one thing that's very important with that is that it has to be very specific. So instead of just saying, here it is, figure it out, um, we ask people to explain why they nominated that person. Another thing that usually happens, and teachers have kind of taken it um, on their own, is they usually accompany it with it some type of either nice handwritten note, or they find out what that person's favorite chocolates are, or where they like to get their coffee in the morning, and usually have something that go along with it. Um, and this has been something that the staff really looks forward to on Fridays. That's when we give it to the next person. It also comes with um, a reserved parking spot. So <laughs> some staff have really enjoyed that in the winter months, uh, potentially a little bit better than uh, the nicer weather. After we did that, that was our staff recognizing each other. That really transitioned into them recognizing students. And that's part of our Panther of the Month program. Each month, the teachers have the ability to nominate um, one or two students within their classrooms or even in outside of their classroom. Um, and again, a big part of this, it has, it has to be specific. So the students will get a certificate, we'll go in and read it to the student, and it, it explains exactly why they were potentially nominated. I mean, a lot of times it's never because you got an A on your test or because you got the highest score in the class. A lot of times you hear a lot of those things that we're trying to instill with them, which is character. Um, and those things really go along with our PD promise. This is something we started this year, identifying that the last couple of years of learning has obviously been um, difficult and there's expectations that we have for the students that we really need to uh, potentially reteach. Those things are following the PD promise, which is polite, respectful, optimistic, making good choices, integrity, being safe, and also being encouraging. Every month we had a different um, part of that promise that we would read a quote to in the morning and really focus on how do we really um, learn those different, um, those different attributes. So at the end of the month, we also have these PD promise cards. Students have the ability to um, show those positive behaviors, keeping that promise, and classes can turn in these raffle cards to win things like extra recesses, game days, we even have a confetti um, dunk tank, a confetti dunk tank that uh, the students get to try and dunk confetti on myself and their classroom teacher that has been uh, really enjoyable. 
This year, we also welcomed the RISE classroom. This has been such a great um, component of Pierce Downer. I, I want to applaud Dr. Kadard and the entire RISE staff for um, building out such a wonderful program. We, we, I felt like we did this the right way. We had a committee that was made up of Pierce Downer um, st staff. We obviously had um, the RISE staff, administrators, and we've really um, welcomed just that program. It's been such a great highlight to our school. And our sixth grade students are also um, pushing into those classrooms, which has been such an unbelievable opportunity watching them build those relationships and really those leadership skills. So now I'm going to welcome the Pierce Downer Student Council. They're going to talk a little bit about what they've been doing um, last year, as well as some of the great things we've been doing this year. So first up, we have our happy dog, Heartbreak. And here's Alex to tell you about it. Uh, last year, we did a fundraiser that gave funds to the West Suburban Humane Society uh, in cooperation with the Barkery, which is downtown Downers Grove. Uh, students could join a Zoom with the Barkery employees, and they would then teach them how to create a pumpkin treat for their dogs. Uh, student council managed to get around $600 dona dollars in donations, and it was a very enjoyable experience. We also have Mrs. DeMarco here, um, who's one of our student council representatives along with um, Ms. Minardi. And that event was probably one of the first things we really were able to do last year that seemed somewhat normal, even though it was over Zoom. Um, and they just really knocked it out of the park. That was a really well attended um, event that raised some great funds. Hi, my name is Priya Fisher. And I I've been a part of student council for two amazing years. Today I will be talking about Spirit Week. Here, we can, here you can see everyone's smiling faces um, participating in all the fun Spirit Days. First we had Cozy Winter Day, which is one of my favorite ones uh, because you really could just throw on your comfy clothes and it was a lot of fun. Um, next we have um, PJ Day, which also I really liked because you could really just roll out of bed and then go to school. And then next <laughs> we have um, Next, we had Mitch Match Day, and uh, Mitch Match Day was really fun because I found it hilarious seeing everyone in their Mitch Match outfits. Next, we had Tie-Dye Day. Tie-Dye Day was a lot of fun because you could see everyone in their bright colors showing off their favorite tie-dye clothes. And lastly, we had Sports Day. As you can see, most of this pictures up here are from Sports Day. So we had a lot of people um, participating in it, and um, it was a lot of fun. It was so cool to see all of student council's ideas coming to life through uh, all the spirit days. Hello, my name is Allie Harrison, and I'm a student at Pierce Downer School. I'm also in the student council here. In October, one of the activities that we do is Red Ribbon Week. Red Ribbon Week is a whole week of being healthy and doing the right thing. We have five fun activities though, during those five school days. The first time we did was on Monday, Too Bright for Drugs Day. This day was when we dressed in bright clothing, tie-dye, or orange clothes. And Tuesday, on Tuesday, it was Too Cool for Drugs Day. We wore sunglasses to be too cool for drugs. On Wednesday after that, on Wednesday, after that, it was cool, stay healthy day. We wore exercise clothing to show, to show that we chose a low, healthy lifestyle to be drug free. On Thursday, we dressed in red from head to toe. Then on, finally on Friday, we got to scare away the drugs by wearing our Halloween costume. Red Ribbon Week was full of fun. Hi, my name is Addie and I'm a part of the Student Council. I've been a part of the Student Council for two years and would love to tell you about our wonderful Winter Wonderland event. Just a remi reminder, this was all in the height of COVID and we still managed to pull it off following all of the guidelines during that time. I'd like to just give a brief, brief definition of the Winter Wonderland. The Winter Wonderland is an event where students can go to all different stations and do things like crafts, make reindeer food, and etc. Now I'm gonna get into the specifics. For all the different stations, there was about two or three student council members. At the big center, there was an adult to manage all the money. Everyone participating will get a punch card, and you can only go to the, each station once. So every time they participate in a station, they get their card highlighted. On the screen, you can see um, some of the pictures we took during Winter Wonderland. During the craft, you decorated snowflakes. During the bake sale, you could um, buy homemade baked, go baked goods for one or two dollars. At the photo station, there is a photo booth with props, um, and you can take pictures in front of the backdrop. For the reindeer food, you can make your own reindeer food with using oats, glitter, and more. For the cookie decorating, you could decorate your own cookie and take it home to eat. For the hot cocoa, you could get hot cocoa, then drink it outside. 
For the candy cane guessing, you could guess how many candy canes were in the bin. And that concludes our Winter Wonderland event. For Valentine's Day, our school decided to make Valentine cards for not only each other, but for two places, Cedars Living Center in Providence. The student council made drawings to color so other kids in our school could decorate them and give them away. We had a lot of fun making these drawings and coloring them. We hope to do it again soon. Um, next we have Teacher Appreciation Week. Teacher Appreciation Week was a huge success. Um, first we had, which happened like really recently, like last week. First we had uh, Bring a Teacher a Flower Day and all the teachers were so excited to see all the um, flowers they got, all the beautiful flowers they got. Next we have um, Share Your Favorite Recipe with Your Teacher. Again, all the teachers were really excited to go home and learn all these yummy recipes that the students gave to them. Next, we had create something for your teacher. This was fun for the students and the teacher. The students were able to create something fun and like colorful for the teacher, and the teacher was able to admire it. Next, we have bright student. Um, for this one, the teachers loved because all the kids were all like bright and happy, and the teachers loved to see all the kids' bright, smiling faces. And next, and last, we have dressed like your teacher. All the teachers love to see the mini me, and it, I found it hilarious seeing all, everybody dressed like the teachers. <laughs> and it was like you were looking in a mirror. Thank you for listening. Me, me, me. <laughs> um, my name is Ella. Um, as you might know, Pierce Downer is trying to raise money for a new playground. Behind the face is how we are raising that money at Pierce Downer. It is a way to get all the Pierce Tower community can con to contribute money to getting a new playground, including teachers. And for in order for a teacher to be pied, you need to buy a one dollar raffle ticket and go for it to be pied. Not only is it easy con to contribute in, it is very fun. <laughs> can we give them a round of applause? They did a great job. Something that I think is, is really important to recognize is that our student council really comes up with a lot of these ideas on their own. Ms. Minardi and Mr. Marco really give them a lot of autonomy in building these things out, obviously within reason, um, but I think it's amazing to watch these students really come up with some, some ideas and see it go through to fruition. Um, it's a really great experience, and thank you very much for, for, for coming today. You guys did a great job. Um, the next thing we have is our Pierce Downer PTA. We have our co-presidents, Melissa Odenbach and Melissa Poyer, if you'd like to come up, and they'll talk a little bit about the great things that our PTA have been doing. Hello, I'm Melissa Poyer. I'm Melissa Odenbach. <laughs> and we've actually been on the board, I've been on the board for a while, but I was a co-president last year, so through the pandemic, so you know, a lot of things were getting canceled, and the PTA was really still trying to, you know, support the school and do things for the kids as we normally would, but that was a different year, which brings us to this year, which, you know, we're back into school activities and back to normalcy in the school, um, which is great. So some of the things that we were able to provide this year is, for instance, like even the back to school party. And um, we did a fall fest, which the, was the first time we ever did that, which was a great success for the school, um, bringing back like the daddy daughter dance and the kickball event. Um, and other things that we support the school is also like Teacher Appreciation Week, was, which was last week, um, which every single day of the week we were able to provide lunch to, to the staff, um, which they love. Uh, teacher grants, we were able to provide seven grants for the teachers this year. And then also teacher experiences, we did as well. And then we were also able to do a few things to support our students, which we were thrilled. We've had a couple year hiatus. Um, we brought back assemblies most recently this spring. Um, a few weeks ago, we did an assembly with Matt Wilhelm, who's a BMX writer and motivational speaker. We did a really engaging assembly and performance for the kids. Um, we also brought back Fun Lunch at the end of um, last year, which is a program where we bring in a hot lunch. Parents have the opportunity to sign up on select Fridays. It's also a great way that we can allow our parent volunteers back into the school building. Um, parent volunteers come in, help assemble the lunches for the kids and pass them out. So we roughly did that, I think, one Friday every month um, for five or six months. And then we're looking forward to a successful end of the year. We've got several year-end events coming up in the next three or four weeks. Um, our school's annual fun run, 
which is a mile run where we close the streets around the Pierce Downer neighborhood. Um, kids will run in that, as Melissa mentioned, the mother-son kickball event, um, and then our art cut event, um, which is held next Friday, and it's a celebration around the world where families can come in, each, different classrooms have different themes, celebrating different countries, Colombia, is one this year where they'll get to participate in art projects, music, and food um, for select countries. And then the students are all going to participate in a school-wide mural um, and hopefully produce um, a collective piece of art that can be displayed in our school. Thank you for having us. So, yeah, thank, thank, you. You. thank you. I think they're really underplaying the magnitude and impact that they have on Pierce Downer School. Um, we're extremely grateful for our for our PTA, and I'm not sure I've ever worked with this, a group of parents who are uh, just remain so so student centered um, in the decisions that are being made and recognizing the importance and impact that they have on our our students, but also um, how they can really go through the teachers to help support them in a lot of those efforts. Next, we have Kelsey and Mackenzie, who are part of our Play at Pierce Playground Committee. Um, a few months back, we came and, and asked um, for permission to. Um, start looking at how do we fund a new playground at Pierce Downer School and um, our committee which is um, kind of a subcommittee of our PTA has really just done a phenomenal job of um, taking it and running and I'm extremely impressed for them to uh, share what they've been been up to all right we've recently kicked off our fundraising efforts earlier this year and I'm so proud to say that we're already 54% of the way to our goal um, our total goal is $250,000, and we fortunately received $75,000 from the state of Illinois. And the Pierce Downer community, through a combination of generous contributions from our sponsors, as well as fundraisers, has already raised $60,000. So we have a line of sight to hit our $250,000 by the end of the year, and so we can hopefully start building next summer, so fingers crossed. And on May 2nd, we launched an input survey on our playatpierce.org website where all members of the Pierce Downer community can vote on what colors they'd like to see on the playground, what equipment they'd like to see on the playground, since it really is for the entire community and we wanted to try and get as many different voices heard as possible. Some of the events that are coming up and next week, we are having a spirit week with the student council with the pie in the face at the end of the week. We're very excited about. Our biggest fundraiser is on May 21st. It is a golf event. We have 100 golfers, as well as a silent auction and a dinner afterwards. And then on August 7th, we have a trike event um, targeting our younger families and incoming kindergartners. So you can stay in the know. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Play at Pierce, <laughs> or visit our website, playatpierce.org, to help support our cause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So kind of rounding it up and, and thinking about the past couple of years and what it means when we say we are PD, I think it can really boil down to just being proud of, of the school that we go to, really wanting our, our students and families and our staff to, to have pride in being a part of Pierce Downer. And this is not a typo. They didn't you know forget something here. Um, we certainly <laughs> recognize that it's, it's the eyes that make the we. Um, so um, collectively, you know, the, the sum is certainly greater than the parts at Pierce Diner School. We are so excited for, for the work that we've been doing these past couple of years. I'm unbelievably um, in awe of the staff and the students and just the way that they have, have taken it on the past couple of years and continue to, to move forward and do great things. But I'm also excited for all the great things that we have coming up. Um, and that's, again, what it means when we say we are PD. So thank you very much for your time tonight. Thank, thank you. you. So much. Thank you, Mr. Wagner. And we have uh, some gifts here for the student council members. Wonderful job, guys. Principal 
<laughs> That's right. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Great job, Thanks kids. Thank you so much. All right, Good listed question. on tonight's agenda are four communications received by the board. Are there any additional communication board members would like to share at this time? No. All right. Then we are on to our spotlight on the school. Today we have our school environment survey. Megan Hewitt. Good evening. Good evening. Um, tonight, I look forward to sharing the results from this year's school environment survey with you. Uh, before I delve into the results, I want to share um, some quick background and context for this year's survey. Um, as you know, all of our students transition back to a full in-person learning environment this school year. And uh, District 58 did a lot of great work to support students throughout that transition, but it was still a transition. And um, many of our students did struggle a little during the transition. Um, so that is a theme that you'll see comes up in the survey results. Um, narrowing down even further, if you look at the survey window, it was February 15th to March 11th. Um, the district school environment survey is a district created survey that um, we've offered for many, many years. Um, we've offered the same consistent set of questions since 2015, and we try to offer the survey at the same time as the state's five essential survey. So that is why we offered it from February 15th to March 11th, but if you think about what was going on in the community um, at that time, um, there was a lot going on. Um, literally on February 14th, that was the day when District 58's mask requirement became a uh, mask recommended policy. Um, and then a few days later, we had a snow day. Um, and both of those um, brought about a lot of, uh, had many opinions in our community um, and brought uh, forth, understandably, a lot of emotions too. So as you can see, this year we had over 1,900 people take the survey, which is a really great response rate. It is our highest um, response rate ever. Um, a lot of really great engagement, over 500 more responses than last year. And I think, oops, I think last year, um, oops, hold on, getting ahead of myself. Mm -hmm. I think last year uh, may have been the highest uh, ever at that point too. And I think, uh, I might be speculating, but we had a lot of community members who um, had a lot of opinions during these transitions that were taking place in our community and the survey did offer them a really good outlet to share those perspectives with our community. Um, compared to last school year though, uh, despite those challenges I just shared, our, our uh, district still received very strong results on this survey. Um, there were 19 quantitative questions in all except for two were within three percentage points of last year, either three up or three down. Um, the two that had uh, a greater difference, um, there was one question related to feedback that declined by 4% and one that uh, regarding the school's appreciation for school diversity and respect that declined 6%. Uh, those are areas that we certainly are looking at, but um, as we go through some of the survey data and survey feedback, we are trying to keep into context um, the timing of the survey and how that may have affected some of the feedback we received. Um, each year I go through some of the quantitative uh, questions, the same set of questions, just to give each of you um, an idea of where, um, how we performed as, along with some historical context. So I will go through the next um, set of slides relatively quickly, but if you have any questions about them, you can certainly ask. First being, my child is getting a quality education. After we saw a little bit of a dip last year with COVID, um, our numbers are starting to track higher again, which is great. My child is cared for by adults at school. Showed a slight dip. The school is a supportive and inviting place for students. My child's school focuses on teaching the whole child, including social and emotional skills, um, holding relatively consistent from last year um, after seeing a slight <coughs> decline pre-COVID. Um, parent feedback is considered in the school's decision making. This was the other question um, that had, this was the question that had the second highest decline. Um, and while we're certainly looking at this, um, I do have some positive um, feedback about feedback to share later on in this presentation. Um, 
that will also go into our review of the survey. And my child's school fosters an appreciation of student diversity and respect for each other. This was that question that saw the greatest decline and one that we are certainly looking at uh, within the context of the survey time frame. My child's teacher communicates with me about my child's progress. This showed um, a slight increase this year. So at the end of the survey, there are two open-ended questions. The first asks, what is one thing that District 58 and or your school does well? And um, 809 people answered the survey. And after analyzing every single open-ended comment, um, five themes emerged. These are actually the same themes that emerged last year. Some of the keywords are differently, different from last year. Um, but it's, it's good to see that these, uh, these themes continue to be very strong, very overwhelmingly clear that these are the five areas um, that the, the majority of comments related to. Strong communication, um, the second being a caring and supportive environment. Often when um, someone talks about the caring and supportive environment, um, good teachers and strong leaders also go hand in hand with that. So it's great to see so many um, positive <coughs> comments about how um, supportive our teachers and staff have been, especially throughout the pandemic. Uh, we received a lot of really positive comments about our curriculum and our COVID response. The survey also asks um, community members to share one thing that District 58 and or their school can improve upon. And we received about the same number of responses. Um, here, um, there were five themes that were also defined, but unlike the the first open-ended question, I felt like the responses to this question were a lot broader. They covered a lot more um, categories and concerns, um, really um, going beyond these areas. So it's something, of course, we're going to look at. But um, you know, kind of how how I explained at the beginning of this presentation, um, the time frame of the survey was when there were a lot of changes regarding masking and COVID protocols, and that was a very large. Um, area of um, that was brought um, as an area of improvement for this question um, and then some students with as they struggled to transition back to a full day environment there we have seen um, in fact district 58 and school districts across the country have seen increases in student behavior um, issues and concerns so we have we did see that as a, thir a theme as well um, and it's something that we are ongoing working on um, and it's something we will continue to address um, this year and into the coming school years. And the other three themes, curriculum, communication, and facilities, those uh, topics are all the three um, tenets of our strategic plan. So we're already working very actively to address those areas and make improvements. Um, and the feedback that the survey provided will help us uh, guide our continued improvements in those areas. So all of our administrators received uh, the survey results. Our principals received the detailed survey results for their specific schools, and then our district administration uh, received um, all of the results. And we'll be using those results to guide our school and district improvements, as well as to help us set our goals. Um, and tomorrow we'll be posting all of the survey feedback um, from the survey on our website, so anyone in the community can also view it. So next, I'm going to briefly preview our um, two of our communication surveys. Um, we offered two surveys uh, related to objectives on goal two of our strategic plan, which is connecting the community. The first survey is um, an internal staff survey, um, only four questions regarding our 58 Connects staff newsletter. We uh, publish 58 Connects every other week, um, which uh, on alternating weeks with our community mm -hmm. newsletter. Um, and we asked staff just four quick questions whether this, um, the newsletter accomplishes our strategic goal regarding internal communication. We asked them for one thing uh, that they like about the newsletter, we should continue. We, and we asked one thing that we can improve upon. And finally, we asked them um, if they prefer the newsletter in its current format or if they would like more or less information. So really good information to share. 98% said that we met our goal. In fact, of 
the 166 people who responded, only three people didn't say yes. One person said no, but then they went on to say a positive comment and did not offer any constructive criticism. And two people said other and answered, it does if people read it. So really positive uh, feedback there. And then we also, the majority of our um, staff also prefer it in its current format. So we'll go through um, these results a little bit more in depth with the district leadership team next week, but here, this is just a quick uh, snapshot on, um, for, for you tonight. And then finally, we offered our annual communication survey to our community at the end of April. Usually we offer this survey at the end of May, early June, but we wanted to move it up a little bit this year so our district leadership team could review the results in detail in May. Um, unlike the school environment survey, this survey actually had a decline in the number of people who responded, um, only 429. And again, now is a very busy time of, school, of the school year, so it's, people might have a little bit less appetite for responding to a survey at this time. Um, here's a quick overview of the quantitative um, questions from that survey. Uh, what's interesting is um, People's overall satisfaction with communication efforts did decline a little bit, but every other quantitative question either stayed the same or showed improvement. Um, I was particularly happy to see the responses to the feedback questions. We added those um, that set of questions to the survey um, after the most recent strategic plan was created because the, the strategic uh, plan called for us to better evaluate um, the feedback, the, you know, our, the way we request feedback, how we use feedback, um, and consistently all the feedback questions certainly have shown improvement since the baseline year of 2019, and they've all either stayed the same or shown improvement since last year. So that's very good to see. Um, and then lastly, um, overall, our stakeholders were um, mostly satisfied with the frequency of district and school communications, and the majority um, said that they received just enough information on most topics. Um, with the areas that the most popular areas wanting more are uh, pretty consistently from year to year. New programs, curriculum, and student support services. So we, we will continue to look at these topics as areas that we can enhance. Um, and then what's next for this? Um, the last question of the survey asks the community if they want someone to contact them directly to talk about their survey. We had 12 people respond with their contact information, so this week I'll be reaching out to all 12 um, to have follow-up conversations. And um, these results will also be shared with our district and school um, leadership and um, as well as a full presentation with the district leadership team next week. And after that um, district, leaders, district leadership team presentation, we will post those survey results online as well. So that is everything in a nutshell. Is, are there any questions um, for me or for anyone else on the team at this time? I, I guess if you go back to slide 14, where we kind of had the themes of potential improvement opportunities, right? Sure. And I, I think, uh, you know, when I, I think of improvement and kind of the roadmap forward. You alluded to the strategic plan kind of already, you know, it's already in flight. We're going to be addressing some of these things. But as you kind of go through all those words on paper and kind of all those uh, responses, what action would you recommend that we kind of take at this moment in time? Do you want, I mean, I can. You can go first. I'll, I'll go, go first. Yeah. Sure, I'll go first. <laughs> I think. Um, I think a best way to address it really is having uh, building principals looking at their individual school results because they really do vary from school to school and different themes do emerge once you uh, split it up by the school. And then from a district level, um, I'm sure Dr. Russell will want to look at it collectively as a district, but I think each of us um, in our departments analyzing feedback related to our area of expertise. I know I, I, I look forward to both the school environment survey and the communication survey to help inform some of our improvements. Um, you know, I've already, so, uh, here for one quick example, this is more related to the 58 Connect survey um, and not the school environment survey, but there was a suggestion about adding um, action items to the different sections of the newsletter to help, you know, the, the newsletter is already fairly succinct, but to help um, direct our staff, um, direct their attention more quickly. 
adding little uh, um, action alerts to the different topics. So that was something that I saw come up a few times and it was something very easy that we could incorporate and we have. Um, but some of the deeper um, uh, pieces of feedback that we've gotten might take a little bit more time to really talk through as a, as, as a team. Um, but and, you know, it's, what's good here is I, I can see some of the, the feedback items that come up repeatedly and can understand that that is something that might be a bigger issue. So some of those conversations are yet to happen. Um, I know personally I've already been looking at it from, from my individual level and then uh, I think Kevin has, I know he has some additional feedback for some of the future work with it. Yeah, I, I think there's multiple levels that we look at this. The first thing is if it's tied directly to the strategic plan, one of the jobs that we have is to go back to the uh, district leadership team and say, where are we strong? Where can we improve? And really getting solid suggestions from our district leadership team. When we're looking at this data, though, it's in the aggregate. And so one school may be very far up and another one might be very far down in a particular area. So what I do with this information is this information is primarily from our families. The five essential information is primarily from our staff and our students. We sit down with the building principals in June and make this part of their annual goal setting for the upcoming school year. And so per the para legislation, all administrators have to set goals just like all teachers do. There are student growth goals, but then there are also professional goals. And so what each building principal will do and each administrator is they will write a quantitative improvement goal based on this survey information. And then they'll work throughout the school year with their building leadership team to implement that goal. So for instance, behavior is a great example of one. You're not really going to see behavior in the strategic plan. Um, but certainly, that is a topic of conversation. And so just this Friday at our principal meeting, now that this data is made public, the way we first start that is we, we have a study of best practices and what's going on in our buildings and who's leading that out. So Friday morning, we'll have that conversation with all of our principals. Then I will meet individually with our principals to see how that will impact their building. One of the common things that's coming up already with behavior is this school year we were so excited to get the kids back in school and, and get going with learning that perhaps we should have spent more time being more deliberate about our expectations and our routines. And so that is something that the principals are already working on as we go into next school year. Middle school is another great example of it with a new advisory period where you can continually, <coughs> you know, continually talk with students and all those things. So Steve, to answer your question, the action plans are individualized to each building with their building principal in the goal setting process, then the BLT at the building level helps monitor that, and the DLT at the district level helps monitor that. And so we do use this data, especially if we're gonna have 1,900 of our families respond, we need to put that in action. Um, I'm very proud of the data. There are certainly some things that we've gotta improve on, but given the timing of this and what we've been through in the last two and a half years to see where this data is, um, I think we're doing a really good job, but there are some areas that we can continue to get better at. Yeah, thanks. And in terms of just the, the feedback, right, you know, we are, you know, 1,900 people are taking the survey and, you know, some things we're going to take action on and others, you know, the, the review may actually say, hey, we're actually going to stay the course. And, you know, how do we, you know, after those reviews take place in June, what's that, how do we kind of close the loop to kind of point to something to those 1,900 individuals that take the survey to say, like, th this is, the, the actions that are taken as a result of that, or, or no action taken. Yeah, so I think that comes in two forms. The first form is gonna come in your school improvement plan that we are gonna put out there for all of our families to see. The second place where you'll see that come into action is you know things like curricular open house, when the principal is addressing families, or in the beginning of the year newsletter where we share with families, hey, this is what we heard, these are the things that we're improving. So you see that in multiple forms. But really, the school improvement plan is that actionable plan where you're going to see that. And then also, as we meet with families next year and we set out, hey, these are the goals, this is what our focus is going to be, we inform our families that that's what we're working on. And then through the goal setting process and the evaluation process with the principals, that's when I sit down and we review the data to say, did you hit it, did you not, why or why not? And then we you know, build on that goal setting process from there. So I have a, a kind of a follow-up mm -hmm. kind of scenario. So you talked about the behavior piece, right? Mm -hmm. And like something like facilities, I know we can point to we're seeking the referendum, we want to improve that, right? How are we getting feedback from staff across the board to see how it aligns with this behavior um, responses from the uh, parents and, and yeah. the community to see if do the, does that input align 
Do they have the support that they need? What more support do they need? Um, because behavior is a big thing, right? And, and there, that's a lot to take on. So, you know, how can we help support staff in the classroom, essentially our frontline workers, right? Like yeah. how, do we, how do we make sure they have what they need? And, and are we gathering some kind of data or input from them on that that goes to the principal level that then comes to you? Yeah, so that's a great question. And I would say, not only are we seeing alignment between our families and our staff, we're seeing alignment between our administrators, and I'm certain the board would see that alignment too around concerns of how students got back to in-person learning and some of those routines and structures that they need more support with. And so in terms of how can you help as a school board, I think you're already doing that, especially at one of our bigger schools like Herrick, mm -hmm. by allowing more counseling staff, more psychology staff, that can free up the building principal and the assistant principal to, to work on that. In terms of the feedback that we got from staff, one of the things that staff has really asked us to do, especially at the middle school level, is to be very deliberate in intent as we close out the year and as we begin the year about what are our common expectations. In addition to that, all buildings are looking for more guidance and more support when it comes to setting those common expectations, um, not only in the classroom, but also in those other areas where we tend to see more problem behavior, whether that's hallway, lining up before or after school, lunch, recess, right? right? And so as we go into the summer and as we go into next school year, that is the exact conversation we're having with our administrators and then as we come back to really start the school year off with those strong expectations but then continue to work through next school year with our staff on those common expectations and how do we fine tune that? Because we do have very deliberate common expectations already in things like our handbook. But we know we need more. And so two things that we're looking at as a district in, in you know, collaboration with our staff are you know, programs like a CHAMPS or a PBIS to see, you know, would these really fit our district? Do we need to go that far? And so those are conversations that really stem from our teachers and our building administrators that we're continuing to support um, with the district. The trick with that is, though, it would be very tempting and very easy for me to say as the superintendent, here's PBIS or here's CHAMPS and you implement it come August. Um, that would not work out very well. So the approach that we're taking is going to be much more deliberate. First and foremost, what are those common expectations that we have? Are we doing the, the, the sufficient job or an efficient job making sure that we share those with our students, that we model those with our students at the start of the year? And then how do we work with the staff at each school as we go through the year around fine tuning that and then improving that? So that is definitely the work. And to answer your question, that is the one thing that I would say everyone who works here is walking in that same direction. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is it's not unique to District 58. Um, that being said, even though other districts are experiencing this maybe even at higher levels, we have to do something about it and we have to fix it. And, and so that is exactly what we are in the process of doing. Okay, good. Yeah, right. Because so, my main concern is, you know, expectation without support is a setup for yeah. not, not having a successful program, right? So to ensure that those staff that have the expectation have what they need going into it to then that benefits everybody, right? Yeah, because I think what you're seeing now is we have a lot of staff members, you know, myself included, who have ideas of what should those common expectations yeah. be. Well, that's great, but if, you know, 700 people have seven different sets of expectations, it's bound to fail or maybe not be as productive. And so really having those deliberate conversations with our staff and coming to consensus is the way we want to go. And that's why, again, at the principal meeting this Friday, we have basically a study of best practice to say, what's really working well in these particular areas at your school in terms of behavior, how can we replicate that at our other buildings, where are you seeing success, taking that back and continually working that through with staff. I'm excited about this work. I think our principals have already started to embrace this. I know our staff wants this. And so certainly that is something that, um, you know, it's a common theme that we want to continue to work on. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Any other comments, questions? Thank you. All right, thank you so Appreciate much. It. Thank you. Again. Thank you. Thanks, Megan. Great job. All right, that moves us on to the reports to the board. First up is a superintendent report, Dr. Russell. All right, it is very hard to believe that it's May 9th, uh, but here we are, and uh, the weather finally broke, so that is good news. Um, it is going to start getting hotter in our schools, so uh, we are going around this week starting to uh, make sure all the unit uh, air conditioners and the windows work and things like that, but uh, it certainly is going to be hot. So if any parents are, are listening or staff members, uh, you know, continue to, to dress appropriately as we go into Thursday and Friday, because it certainly is going to be uh, hot in our buildings. Um, 
On behalf of the Board of Education and our entire staff, I'd like to thank Pierce Downer, uh, the student staff and administration, and the families for a wonderful presentation this evening. I thought they did a great job, and it's always great uh, to see our kids up here as well. So uh, I know they all left for the evening. Uh, they probably have homework to do and other things, but uh, we wanted to thank them. I also wanted to thank our Illinois State Superintendent. Uh, we had a visit from Dr. Ayala last Friday. We visited Bel Air School, and then we also visited Hillcrest School. Uh, Principal Borschelt and Principal Zepka did a fabulous job, and it was great um, seeing uh, all the kids. And I can speak, uh, especially for the Hillcrest kindergartners. They put us through the ringer with the questions, but I think we passed and uh, <laughs> did a good job. But the kids were awesome, as always, and it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. In terms of curriculum and instruction, just an update, uh, today begins our spring benchmarking period. Over the next three weeks, District 58 students will complete NWA math and Ames web assessments. We appreciate all the coordination that's taking place, both at home and our buildings, uh, to make that come to fruition. As we discussed at our last meeting, the Illinois School Report Card for District 58 and all 13 schools have been publicly released uh, for the final time. While there are still some minor discrepancies in the data, including our academic achievement data, that does appear to be accurate, though, our academic achievement data. We're still seeing things like uh, the percentage of students taking the test that doesn't necessarily match, but for the most part, it's fairly accurate. Uh, but we do want to put that kind of caveat on there. In terms of finance, I want to congratulate our financial advisory uh, committee, the Board of Education, uh, Todd Dreyfus, our CSBO, and his staff. For the 20th year in a row, we've received the highest um, recognition from the State Board of Education for our finances. I think that's so very important for our district so our community knows that we continue to embrace uh, not only transparency, but really being a great steward of the taxpayer money. As we go into a potential referendum, I think that's very important that we demonstrate to our community. So congratulations to District 58, Board of Education for 20 years in a row of receiving the highest recognition uh, from the state of Illinois. Um, and that is not something we can always take for granted because you can see there was a time that we didn't get that recognition as a state or a, as a school district, so we're very happy with that. In terms of personnel attached to this update, you will see a tentative, and I have to stress tentative, um, staffing slash enrollment plan based on current enrollment numbers and past history of what we'd expect at elementary schools in terms of sections. I want to remind everyone as they look at that, which is now going to be posted in board docs, that it is tentative and it is subject to change. So for instance, you could see one school that has very large class sizes, but maybe only two sections. That could change if those numbers continue to grow. You could have another school that has really small numbers, and it looks like they're going to have two sections, but that could change. So one of the things that we do every single year is we do not fill all of the positions in case a section doesn't break then we can reassign that teacher to a different uh, classroom teaching position. And of course, if we end up having to break extra sections, then that's when we would go out and hire staff. So again, this is tentative. We're almost complete with our registration, so we will continue to bring this update to you um, every board meeting until the start of the school year. But you can kind of get a sense of where things are shaking out um, in terms of the numbers. But again, I have to stress that this is not final, and it is subject to uh, change. So. For those who are out there right now starting to see if your school may have that extra section or not, please don't read anything um, into this because this is a draft and it is tentative. I think I've covered all my bases there, so I'll stop. <laughs> is it tentative? <laughs> Did I say that's a draft? Okay, uh, in terms of technology, in February, the Board of Education approved early the purchase of new iPads. Um, I am very, very pleased to say that almost all of our iPads are in. We still have some that are outstanding, um, but we've received the invoice, which is an indicator that the rest of the iPads are coming in. This seems like a very small thing, but I have to tell you how important it is that we have our new warehouse, which is the old ASC, which is now the District Service Center. We have that door, and what that door does is it allows everything to be driven into the building. So simple things like letting a pallet out or unloading a pallet is now a much easier task. I'm looking at James and Justin because when we were at the Longfellow Center, when pallets like that got dropped off, everyone in the building, depending on the weather, had to immediately stop what they were doing, open the pallets up, and bring them through the door. It could take six, seven hours, and sometimes even longer than that. Now, with that rolling door, we literally just put the forklift or the truck right in there, we dump them off, not dump them, that's not the best <laughs> word, um, but then we can take our time and do it the right way. It's a much more efficient use of space, but it's also a much more efficient use of personnel. 
So a simple thing like a loading dock is, is a very nice thing to have and it does make us more efficient as a school district and so we are very, very happy uh, to have that new rolling door on the east end of the DSC. In terms of student services, extended school year ESY, our summer learning program for students with disabilities who are eligible during the IEP process. Uh, registration is closed at the end of April and we're thrilled to be welcoming almost 80 students this summer. We're diligently working to fill all the positions in the hiring process. I want to thank Jessica and Jane and all the support staff for uh, making sure that we do that. But uh, extended school year will be uh, here before we know it and, and so far so good with all of that. In terms of public relations, we had a very busy week last week, especially with the Education Foundation. They held their annual Distinguished Service Award. We honored 53 staff members who received nominations. And the two winners were technology technician Todd Cherney and Whittier fifth grade teacher Cheryl Lyons. One of the pleasures I have as superintendent is I get to go deliver those awards and that uh, was a lot of fun. We want to especially thank our staff members who nominated their colleagues and then students and families who also nominated their colleagues. It's something very special to hear uh, a student get up there and talk talk about what an impact a teacher has made in their lives or a support staff member. Uh, uh, Wednesday evening we have Select 58 at Herrick where we recognize um, select 8th graders from both middle schools. We're really looking forward to that. That will be uh, Wednesday night. And um, finally the foundation is co-sponsoring a fundraiser for Ukraine's humanitarian aid. There's been a lot of information pushed out on behalf of the foundation. So if you're interested in that please contact Megan Heward or you can look at that information on our website. And then in terms of facilities, we are in the process of getting everything ready for the summer work. Uh, so Kevin is working diligently with our architectural firm along with Todd and Sonali, making sure that those projects that we have slated for the summer are ready to go. And I want to thank our team for that. So um, this is the time of year where we're running the current school year and then planning the next school year in addition to all the summer work. So it's a busy time, but um, you know we want to thank everybody for their hard work and things are moving along uh, nicely. That concludes my report. Thank you. Any questions or comments? No. Wonderful. That brings us into the monthly business and treasurer's report with Todd Dreyfall. When they told me the air conditioning wasn't working, I was just going to come up and say it's uh, report is as written. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the exciting part of this time of year that I can report is that there's not a lot of drama. This is the low cash point time, and in previous years, we have had great concern about will we have enough money on hand to make all of our bills and so forth before those early taxes come in. Uh, I can tell you that um, we don't have to worry about that today, right now, because we are in good shape. Um, and yet, we, uh, we, we know the early, you know, the bills are out. Uh, and that we will restart receiving funds uh, by the end of this month. Um, but it's at that first week or end of May, first week of June, that was always our low cash point. Um, fortunately, right now we have funds on hand uh, and, and things are going um, fairly predictable and as are, and we have an expectation that we'll be within our budget lines. Uh, we have some areas of revenue that are coming in above, uh, some areas of expenditure coming in below. We have a little bit over we had a bad winter and some bad repairs as you can see in the purchase service area of the operations um, that has that impact um, obviously one of the issues we have continually about uh, the aging uh, infrastructure of our buildings and what can be costly repairs when they're 24-hour jobs on weekends or overnight um, to keep the building up and running so um, other than that and then you have on your agenda uh, an item for um, as we continue our process you heard uh, discussion about Pierce Downers playground uh, you have an item uh, for the Indian Trail play playground on your agenda uh, as we continually work on those uh, in connection with the DC the state of Illinois DCO grants uh, that we received from uh, representative Stava Murray's office well then if there are any questions from me any questions comments Thank right. you. Thank you. All right. The policy committee has not met since the last board me meeting. Neither has the legislative committee, the financial advisory committee, or the district leadership team, nor has the health and wellness committee. So that brings us on to our discussion uh, item tonight, which is key performance indicators. Justin Sisson. Thank you. 
Tonight's presentation contains a lot of information, some of which I'm going to go through relatively quickly as it is referenced for many, and I want to express appreciation for the majority of the board who I was able to meet with individually over the past month to really do some, some thorough conversing around what is now summarized in tonight's presentation. So really, we're continuing our conversation around our data partnership with ECRA and the perspectives that that brings that we are working through. We wanted to talk about how we are going to present data three times each year with this new partnership and what that will look like, which ultimately leads then to another uh, brief discussion around our key performance indicators with the hope of being able to bring final feedback to the district leadership team next Monday and ultimately bring those first two indicators back to the board for a vote in June. Many of these slides, you'll see the ECRA um, emblem on the very bottom. This is information shared with us just to, to keep, again, a consistency through the way we are having these conversations. So we talk often about seeing proficiency and growth side by side. So this really is just, again, that visual and representation of what we're talking about, where proficiency is that moment in time, at this moment, on this day, what did the student achieve? Growth looks over time to see what's happened from, from historical points to current points. And one of the things that ECRA really has, has emphasized and that we are excited about working with is that idea of a personalized projection for students. So based on their own past performance, where should they perform if all things remain equal going forward? And so when you look at that, you end up with, so you can see the, the visualization of where their projection should be and then where an actual score might be. And one of the things that we really are going to be focusing on is the space between that student's projection and their actual performance. That really is going to be the indication of the effect size of the growth because it measures what, what had an impact on the student over that period of time. Another component that ECRA works with is what they call a propensity score. And so the propensity score takes all of the academic information we have about every individual student and brings it into a composite achievement score. And then they scale that score where the average is 100 and six, every 16 points is what we call one standard deviation. So typically, statistically, 68% of students in this scaled score, where the average of 100, are going to fall between 84 and 116, or another way to say that is one standard deviation on either side of the average. Those numbers will come back around a little bit later as we look at some of the growth projections. Again, there's some more information here about how that score is, is calculated, but I think that the important summary here is that the propens each student has a propensity score. In our case, they'll have one for reading and they'll have one for math. And you can look at those propensity scores as another way to sort of say, okay, how can I broadly categorize groups of students? Students with low propensity will be 84 and below on that, uh, that scale. Those are the students that are going to be categorized as struggling learners. We've got that average range between 84 and 116. And a student with a propensity score above 116 is assumed to be a high performer, again, based on their prior actual achievement. As we talk about looking at growth, we have been very familiar with looking at MAP growth exclusively. MAP is a national new norm study, and so it sets national benchmarks based on a, a huge sample. When we get down to local growth and some of the things we're talking about, we have all of those, those components in there in terms of MAP data and other pieces of data, but that local component really compares, again, a student to themselves within our local norms. And so it becomes a much more individualized target, and, and in theory, a much more precise projection and target for, our, for each individual student and then each group of students made up of those individual students. This graphic just kind of shows how that progresses. So we start by looking at prior performance on universally administered tests like AmesWeb and MAP and IAR, which, drew, which then ECRA creates based on that information, that propensity score for each student. The propensity score drives the projection, so now that student has a predicted score based on where they've been. We then see the student's actual score and we can finally talk about growth. One of the things to note is that because the student's projection is driven by their propensity score, which takes in all information, that's where that individualization comes in. So whereas MAP says, if your MAP score is X, your next MAP score should be Y. This model says, based on everything we know about you, your MAP score should be this, your IAR score should be this, your AIMS web score should be this. But all of that information goes into the propensity score, which drives the prediction. As we start to think about how do we do some visual representations of this. This is what we would call a projection chart. I'm going to take just a second to show the components here of what this looks like. So 
The green line, oh, and I should say before I go further, every piece of data you're going to see on the screen tonight is a sample of some sort. So there is, this is not, gen, there is one slide that actually has some actual 58 data, but the majority of this is um, all sample data. And you're going to see different headings, like this one says grade 7 spring map. They're just samples from ECRA to show that really any of the assessments can be used in this format. So that green horizontal line that says external proficiency benchmark. Our key performance indicator sets our proficiency benchmark as meeting or exceeding on the state assessment. And so every time we have a report generated from ECRA, that proficiency line is going to either be the actual IAR score, if it's an IAR score that says you meet and exceed at this grade level, or it's going to be the, co the, the correlation of that MAP score that predicts IAR proficiency. So one of, the, one of the key frames for us is when we're talking about proficiency going forward, we are talking about meeting or exceeding on the state assessment. And if it's, and any assessment that's shown will relate to that. The blue lines that go sort of diagonally represent our local norms and what expected growth is for our students. So each one of those dots that you can see between the lines, it represents a student. And the, it, it shows kind of where we expect their scores to be based upon local growth. One of the things then to recognize is that within those two blue lines, that's the range of expected growth. So in a projection chart like this, every student is going to be shown between those lines because that's what, we ex that's what the model predicts. This is their expected growth based on projection. And then the last piece of this, you can see the two vertical, they're actually yellow if you can make that out, lines. That's sort of that propensity range. So between those two, and you can see at the bottom on that axis, the 84 and 116, that's your average propensity, higher and lower. So this is what we would see at the beginning of a year where we would say, okay, this is you know, what we are expecting to see for our students in a certain grouping. Then, when we get actual numbers, it starts to look a little more complex. So now these dots represent actual students and where they are and how they perform. And so you can see there are numbers all over all sides of those lines. And again, the score we're looking at has to do with the difference between their projected score and their actual score. So we're really still trying to measure that effect size. What was, their, what, what was the difference between their predicted growth and their actual growth? And we'll go further into what this chart looks like with a few more examples. We had a couple questions on effect size, and so this is kind of a, a detailed explanation, but really the, the, the bottom line behind effect size is that we are looking to see, again, that difference between predicted and actual growth. It, it sort of scales down to this absolute value where 0.0, .0 is you landed exactly where we predicted. And so that anything above 0.0, .0 is more than predicted, anything below 0.0, .0 is negative, is, is less growth than predicted, doesn't mean students didn't gain knowledge, it doesn't mean they didn't learn, it means that they landed a little short of their projection. But what's interesting about this is it has to be 0.3 away from zero to really be statistically significant. And that's just sort of a commonly accepted effect size in the research community. So what's nice about this is with MAP, when we would say does a student meet or exceed, by one writ point in either direction, it was just a straight yes or a straight no. Here, we've got a range of expected growth where a student may not quite meet their target or may exceed it by a little bit, but before we say they've exceeded it, we still have this range of expected. And so that's represented by ECRA with a, a very convenient and helpful color coding system. So this really is sort of that first look at, from the highest level, how can we make some initial interpretations. And so if the dot on a growth report is green, that says that either it was statistically insignificant, which really in our case is going to mean it was such a small sample size most likely that it didn't have statistical relevance, or that dot is that green dot is going to say we are within the expected growth range. If we see a blue dot, that means that we've gone at 0.3 or above, so we've now exceeded our growth projections for an individual student or a group of students. A yellow dot is lower than expected, and then that red dot would be much lower than expected. And so really, the, the idea is that the, the growth or the effect has to be st statistically significant to move to change the color of that from green to blue or green to yellow. And so again, that's not the precision that we sometimes like to talk about, but it's a great way to begin the categorization of data. Again, this is just one more visualization of, you know, we often, we talk about growth. Did our students grow? And this model is saying, did our students grow compared to 
how much they would have grown if we had done nothing else. And so again, what we're measuring is not just student growth, but we're measuring the impact of everything we do in a given school year based on our school improvement process, based on our curricular initiative, based on all of those things. Anything we're adding in to support students is really what we're measuring the impact of over the course of a given year. So the key question when we're talking about all of this data for us is really going to become, did that group of students exceed their projection? Whether it's a proficiency <coughs> projection or whether it's a growth projection, our goal in the simplest term possible is for each student to beat their projection because that means that what we've done in that school year has helped them to grow further and achieve more than they would have if all things remain the same. So here again is what that chart will start to look like with even a little bit more detail. So this is a projection, and you can see at the bottom right, in this case, 51% of students, based on their prior performance in this sample, are projected to meet that proficiency benchmark. Then when you start to see the actual growth chart, a few more things show up. We see that same bottom right, in this example, only 30% of students met their benchmark. Here's a first look at, there's a green dot that says we're within expected growth, but actually we're a little bit on the low side of expected. Overall, this group of students is, is, has slightly negative growth, but still within the expected range. And then again, we can see how many students met their projections in the bottom left corner and did not meet their projections. So this is a really nice way to distill all that information down into a group of students. And what's nice about, again, the ECRA platform is like this example says grade four. We can look at a chart like this for grade four at the district level, for a building at the building wide level. And then a building principal can look at this for grade four at the building level or their entire building. And then we can really get down, and you'll see a little later, to the individual student all from the exact same platform. And so another thing we're doing on Friday, and now what is going to sound like a really riveting principal meeting, <laughs> is we are going to, our principals <laughs> are going to get their logins for the first time and start to work through how they can process and use some of these charts. This is a little different than that four quadrant chart that we had become familiar with. So just to kind of go through this quickly, when we look at the way these fall, again, so the sample being here's where all those dots fall for individual students after we've seen the results. So that circle represents students that are in the higher than expected growth range. Anybody above that blue line, higher than expected, within the blue line is all expected, that range of expected growth, and then below would be our students that have lower than expected. Don't try to follow it because they're different samples each time, but it's just where is the range in that, okay? Then we talk about proficiency. So these are our students who, if it's IAR, met or exceeded, or if it's MAP, are projected to meet or exceed. And these are our students who are below proficiency, who are projected to not meet that target. These are our students who had that high propensity score at the beginning of the year, who we expected high performance of. Our students who had that average propensity at the beginning and low propensity at the beginning. So within one visualization, we actually end up with six quadrants in a way where we can see a number of different things on the same chart. So where does that bring us in terms of when we're going to present data and what we're going to look at? Four major categories. We're going to keep some historical MAP and AIMS presentation for a couple of reasons. One is because it just is a nice clear point of we're used to looking at mean and median MAP scores and what those charts look like. And the other one is we don't want to shift, I don't want us to shift completely away from some of the ways we have historically presented data. We may in a year or two decide that those moment in time slides are obsolete, but for now it builds a bridge from everything people have been accustomed to seeing and have become comfortable with as we bring in new presentation. We're then going to see those growth updates like, like we'll demonstrate, and then again, that we'll look at by grade level, district-wide, by building level, building-wide, and then by subgroups at the district level. And this is something we've talked about a lot, and so when we look at subgroups, I think it really is important for us to start displaying how are our low-income students doing compared to our students who are not low-income? How are our English learner students doing compared to our students who are not English learners? But to keep that sample size appropriate, we're going to keep that only at the district level because once we drill down to the building level, we can start talking about very small groups of students. At a building principal is absolutely going to be looking at that within a building, but for our purview, we're going to keep those at the district level. We'll also look at growth and proficiency projections so we can see what happens, and that really each fall is when we will see what our targets are. And then because of the processing time it takes for ECRA to bring us all that, and then each fall we'll still show the IAR data in that same delineation. Grade level at the district-wide, building-wide, and then suburbs. So just briefly, that's going to look like this. 
We're familiar with these. We're going to keep showing the Ames Web moment in time, the map moment in time, so we can see each benchmarking period, where do we fall. So those are consistent. This is an example of a growth report that we will start, that we will see. And so in this example, first thing we can see up at the top is we're in the expected growth range overall for this sample elementary building. And then you can see by each grade level, you'll be able to see how many, what percentage of students fell into that higher than expected growth range, what percentage of students fell into the lower than expected growth range, and what percentage of students were in the expected growth range. And each grade level in this example gets that same color coding of what range they're in. I want to, for just a minute on this one, draw your attention to the very bottom where it says in the, the large horizontal box, it says all and then expected. If you can take a, just a quick look at that. When we look at expected across the bottom, that 16% high growth, 68% expected growth, and 16% low growth is going to be a consistent metric for every growth report because that ties back to, statistically, that's where students are going to fall. That's what, that's what, that's what we expect. The all just above that, for this sample, you can see there's 15% of students in high growth and 65% of students in low growth. And so when you add those two numbers together, that tells me that this sample building has 80% of their students who are either making expected growth or high growth in this moment. That is the way we will look at our growth tied to our KPI number two. And we can do it for every category. So in, even on this single report, you can look at it for the whole building, and then you can look at it by grade level, where you'll see that kindergartners have a much, if you add those two numbers together, that's, I'm doing it in my head, that's 89%, right? So we're almost 90, and so that, they're way above that 85th percent benchmark that we would be setting as a district. So again, our goal is to see us beat that projection. The same report, then, you can look at by subgroup as you go all the way through. And so you can literally put side by side, and this is all generated for us by ECRA, all of the different subgroups, and we're going to use the, the state-defined groups to say, how do we compare next to each other? So the group that fits a category and the group that doesn't fit a category all get that growth effect size. Proficiency projection, again, this is looking at specific to how did we do on the state assessment. So we'll get that projection each fall based on prior performance. And remember, that's based on combining each individual student's prior performance to the group. So in this sample report, if you look at third grade, 427 students, their projection is 48% of students should meet or exceed that proficiency. And we'll get that all the way through at the building, at the district, all of those reports. And then you'll see the, the final report will give you the actual numbers. When we go back to this then, as we're seeing all of these things represented through these charts, again, any group we look at, we're seeing how many were proficient, how many method projections. There's always in the platform for me or for James or for principals, a button that says, now I want to see those kids. And so we just get immediately to the student level. Again, these are all sample names from ECRA sample schools. But right now, by clicking that, we can see all of this information about individual students. What is their growth trajectory right now, and how does it fit in that effect size? What was their actual score? What was their percentage? And all of those things. So it really, all of the questions we've had about how do we get from this level down to this level is, is really artfully answered through this digital platform. So coming back to the KPIs, this is our first key performance indicator that we have looked at before. Nothing on this screen has changed. The metric, again, is how are we measuring? So we've said our, our, our measurement is students achieving a 750 on the IAR or a level four or five or however you want to call it, but it's achieving proficiency at the state level. Our benchmark we've talked about as that state 75th percentile. So looking at when we rank either our schools or our district as a whole against all of the other schools or districts in Illinois, we want to be, according to this, in the upper quartile, the 75th percentile or above. Those annual targets, though, for individual schools, groups, and all that, that's what we set by everything in the slides prior. So we'll measure all of those by the projections that are set each fall. The benchmark is sort of our big picture in the aggregate quick look, not, a, not our only measure of success, but certainly a way to take a first look. All of that is in this slide in a lot of words for reference later. 
<laughs> so now, the question a lot of people had was, well, okay, how do our historical performance compare? And so this is, to be, to be sure, this is an extra thing. ECRA doesn't run this for, as part of their package, but they are willing to continue to do it for us because I said it's, it's important for us to see where are we at in the aggregate as a district. And so what this shows, and we don't have 2021 yet, obviously, but in the two years that were available, if you look at ELA, in 2019, our actual meets and exceeds percentage across the district was 49.7, which puts us in the 73rd percentile when stacked against the districts in the state of Illinois. 2018 ELA was 75th percentile. Our math scores were 48.3 in 2019, 48.3% of all students meeting or exceeding, which would actually put us in the 85th percentile against all the other districts in the state of Illinois when they ran that comparison, which again, is a really interesting number to stop and think about. You know, we, we, we're always cautious not to over-celebrate or, or under-celebrate things, but 48.3 sounds like a failing grade, but it puts us in the top 15% of school districts in the state of Illinois. And so it's just, it, it's a contextualization that doesn't necessarily change the raw data, but is an interesting component to the conversation. So based on this, when we look back at that benchmark, my suggestion is that for ELA, the 75th percentile is, is a fair starting point for our benchmark because we only have a couple of years. There's been some gaps in between. We don't know what it's going to look like this year. For math, though, looking at a, a similar set of numbers, I, I would say the 85th is probably a more appropriate target for us to set as a benchmark for right now. So one of the things I'd like us to talk briefly at least tonight about that we can bring back to the district leadership team is amending that KPI, which to go back two slides, sorry where that benchmark would say state 75th percentile for ELA, state 85th percentile for mathematics. And then again, just to come back to our second key performance, in the, sorry, and so then this is how we'll see whether we beat those projections over time. So it, it, I know the numbers are a little diff difficult to see on the screen, but this again is you can see each grade level's projection for proficiency, and we would get this in the fall when they can see the actual percentage of students that met benchmarks. Question. Thank you. The growth indicator we've talked about, again, this is really looking at student growth. And we will actually get three growth reports for each school year. In the spring, we'll get a growth report that is map data exclusively. And then in the fall, we'll get a growth report that is IAR data exclusively. And then map and IAR sort of brought together as an overall student growth summary report. So there will be three different ways to look at this information as it's reported out each year. And so again, our benchmark here is that 85th percentile, which says that we want to see that student number at the bottom of the report, the students that are in the expected growth range and the higher than expected growth range, those percentages we want to add up to 85 or better as we move forward. For those of you who haven't seen this more than once, I promise it does get more familiar as you start to see it a few <laughs> different times. And so again, this is, and this one actually is um, our fall to winter growth summary that they prepared for us as an example. Again, just to get a sense of where are we in general. And so if you look at the very bottom, we are, where it says all students, that's 25% in high growth, 61% in expected growth. So in this one snapshot sample, we are at the 86th percentile. I mean, we're, we're beating our target by 1%. It, it seems to be, again, statistically a very appropriate target. Then we start to think about how are we going to look at this year over year? How are we going to see longitudinally how we're doing? And I think these charts will really help us to be able to see those key three key pieces. Bottom left, how many students met or didn't meet their own personal projections. Second from right, what is the effect size of that growth on the group of students? And furthest right, what percentage of our students are achieving proficiency based on all of these assessments? It's also worth mentioning in one slide that this, again, really connects beautifully to our school improvement process, especially the way we revised it with cycles of inquiry. The cycles process has us take data and bring it into a focus of, okay, what is all of this information telling us? What is really an area we have for growth or improvement? And how specifically can we be sure that that, you know, what we think might help will actually help? And what specifically can we do to improve in that area? So we've got, you know, we, we get to the point where each building is implementing a few very targeted specific strategies across the building, those projections tell us, okay, if we didn't do any of that, we expect you to grow this much. We measure the impact then by saying how much did we actually grow, and we can really start to see year over year, it, it won't be crystal clear in year one, but we can really start to say, we spent a lot of energy on A, B, or C this year, 
did the effect size of the growth tell us that that was energy well spent, or did it not bring us what we wanted to? And so it, it, and then that feeds the cycles of inquiry process for the next year. So it really brings all of the conversations we've been having around data and student success together in a really nice systemic way. From here, obviously, we're going to talk briefly tonight. We have district leadership team on Monday where we'll bring final feedback from the board and um, this information. And then my hope is to bring those first two key performance indicators back to the board in June, which will also be the first time, hopefully, assuming we get everything generated in time, that we'll start sharing the data in the formats that we've discussed tonight. So now we get to the actual discussion and questions part. First of all, I just want to say thank you. Uh, you. You really did take a lot of time and effort, I know, over the last couple months to really hear what we're looking for on this level. And I know you've got to make that work for what they want at the individual classroom and, and building and uh, level as well. So, so thank you. That was very informative. You and I have had a lot of conversations, so I just want to open this up to uh, conversation from the board. Questions, comments, concerns? Anyone want to start? I love it. Um, as I kind of digest all this and reflect on the conversation we had, uh, you know, last month, I, I think for me it's all about the dashboard aspect of it and, and kind of driving down towards the, the color coding. You know, it oversimplifies it to some degree, but to kind of see those different colored dots, um, that's really beneficial for, for me on the board. And, and so as I kind of look at the district level and the building level, you know, I think we did some rough math. You, you know, if we look at the district level, there's going to be 66 dots, and then each building is going to have 38 dots. For me, I actually want to see that reported out. Whether so, we're, you know, not only just the district level, but each individual building, there's going to be 66 dots, and I want to know exactly how many of those are red, and, and kind of ask those questions as to why is this subgroup red or this grade level or this section in that grade red. So that's kind of what I'm looking for to kind of make sure that we're kind of doing this type of analysis, not at the aggregate level, but also at each of those levels. So for me, I would love to see that dashboard that kind of gives you each and every single one of those data points. And I know we can't talk about them all in, in a forum like this, but I want to, as those reports are generated, I would love to, to see that, that level of detail. Right, and one of the things, and thank you, Steve, one of the things you and I talked about was the difference between what might go in a board report right. and what might be available to board members for additional review. And so I think that's, you know, we can, certainly there's a, there are a ton of things that are available. As I said, our, our principals have, have seen most of this presentation already, but haven't even begun to dive into how they're going to use that and all of that. So, but I think that's, we'll, we'll work through that for sure. Yeah, and, you know, just to kind of share with my fellow board members, we were kind of digging through the, the pages and we were quickly able to see, all right, you know, what's going on in second grade and in this building related to reading. So it was able to kind of really jump out at you and we had some really healthy dialogue as to why is that and, you know, um, so I think it's going to really drive some, some healthy dialogue. Yeah, and I think, again, those kind of, I mean, this will help distill things even more quickly. Right. Those are the conversations that are happening at each of our buildings. And I think, you know, we, we want to be able to just kind of highlight how that work is happening. And I think it's fair to say from an accountability perspective to make sure that all of those are happening and, and how we share that back and forth. And just a, a clarification, I know we kind of looked at those three different moments in time where those building level conversations are happening. And, and I think I jotted down May 22nd and June 5th. Can you maybe talk about what so what is involved in that and kind of sure. what the outputs are? Yeah, so what, what Member Olchik is referencing is we talked about the fact that we carve out time within our professional learning calendar to ensure that there's time at each building to have those conversations. And so we try to do it right at the sweet spot of we finished the benchmarking assessment for students. So obviously, Kevin mentioned that begins this week. So a couple weeks from now, we'll have the first look at some of that student data. It won't all necessarily be in the ECRA dashboard right away, but we'll be able to look at some of it. And so we designate a couple of those Mondays for data meetings and conversations. And so, so at each the building, Monday. then the appropriate people at each grade level, which is going to, you know, are going to, they're going to schedule time to specific to look not only at specific <coughs> students, but also at students as a whole and grade level performance as a whole and building level performance as a whole. So we, we target time for that to happen um, three times a year. It, it doesn't all happen specifically on those Mondays, but that's kind of the, the framework. And we've 
um, I, we, I think I've shared previously, but we've, we've really streamlined and unified the, the questions that we're asking each of those groups of people to reflect on as they're looking at the data, which includes, at the end, a commitment to, do we need to do something differently? And so, you know, as we're looking at spring data, the reflection isn't necessarily, what am I doing for this group of students right now? It's maybe, what information can I pass up? But also, let's look at what happened over the course of this year. Is there something I want to think about and, and reflect on and potentially change in my core instruction as I enter the fall at this grade level in this building. Yeah, and I think the, the last piece from my perspective is just kind of the culture around this, right? We're gonna have red dots. We have red dots now if we kind of don't cherry pick the data of kind of what reports are, are putting out there. And I, I want us to um, bring those conversations forward instead of kind of shy away from it. So I, I think um, you know, accountability sometimes has a negative connotation, and but I, I don't want it to get to that point where we're, we're, we're shying away from those, those discussions. So. so I think this is great. So, so people that aren't excited about it, I'm, I'm very excited. So, <laughs> so uh, hopefully that, that can uh, continue this to, to drive this discussion. No, Thanks. Steve, I, I appreciate you bringing that last point up. Um, no matter what, what, what I like about what we have here is it's, it's a third party presenting the data in an agreed upon format. So no matter what happens with an administration at any given point in time, people in the community say, well, you just showed that because it makes you look better. Or why didn't you show this or that? So I really like that we've taken any subjectivity out of this. And this is, here. here's the report. And it looks similar to what we show at the board table. And that's what our schools go through. And that's what the classroom teachers go through. I also completely agree with you. We would be naive to think that you're not going to have times where you've got blue dots, green dots, yellow dots, and yes, even red dots. They do happen. Why do they happen? Because they're kids. They don't always do everything we expect them to do. But how do we use that data? And accountability isn't a bad word. It can be a great word if we use the data to improve versus <coughs> use the data to punish. Now, if you continually see red dot after red dot for marking period after year after year after year, well then you've got a different conversation. But I do think this is a great opportunity for us to look at data in a way to, for improvement versus punitive. And this board has never really looked at it as punitive. They've always just asked, okay, what are we gonna do now? How are we gonna improve that? And I really wanna commend the work that we did this year. And I'll use Highland's first grade and, and many other first grade as an example. When we saw that data, we did have people out with, you know, metaphorically speaking, the pitchforks in, in September and October saying, I can't believe this, right? But we really looked at it. We put together a great plan. The reading specialists, the support staff, the teachers said, okay, this is our issue. Here's the data. What are we gonna do about it? And you've seen those numbers gradually improve throughout the year. That's what we need to continue to foster with this. The good news is though, we're all looking at the same thing. And so I know it's been a long road to get here, but it's been worth it because to have agreement with the seven board members moving forward, that helps so much as we do our work. Thank you, Steve. I'll take a moment and just say, um, we, we're, you know, we're titling this KPIs and we're in the, and our focus is on approving the, the KPIs next month. And, I, it, and that's absolutely an important aspect of it, right? So that we have something aspirational and something to, to tie ourselves to. But I think what we really need to commend the work on here is uh, the building out of this tool and measurement process in place. Uh, I think it's an incredible, uh, this is an incredible and a consistent way to, to look at the data. And what it allows us to do, I, I, I for one agree with the assessment on what those KPIs should be. I think at the 75th percentile, the top 25% for ELA and the 85th percentile or the top 15% for, for math is a, is a great place to start. But by, by utilizing this tool over the next two years, one of the things that we talked about when we started this process was using this as an extension of our existing strategic plan. And by building out a great tool with solid, consistent reporting, I think it gives us the ability to reach out to our community two years from now, or a year and a half, whenever that process would start, and to sit down with people and go, here's the trajectory that we're on. Are we measuring the right KPIs? Uh, like, for example, we're really looking at that percentile, um, you know, how we compare to the state. Should we have a goal at some point of breaking that 50th percentile of proficiency should that be a goal that we're I'm, I'm not saying it should be we don't have enough historical data or what other aspects of you know when, when we're looking at now that it, it's not a quadrant anymore we got the, the this kind of the six gridded out like 
now that we have that data and we have some time with it, I think it can give us even a, a better idea of, of how we project that. I, we, we moved over it quickly, but things like the, the measurements of, of ROI, I know it's not something that can kind of seem like a bad word sometimes, or you know, bad phrase sometimes in education, but we don't mean it necessarily uh, on dollars spent as much as we mean like if we're taking some time and we've invested in new positions to go in and we look at our projected growth uh, prior to adding that, that new initiative and then we look at it and then we look at it afterwards, did it have an impact? And if not, then we reevaluate and, and take those assets and potentially use them in a different way so that we, we make sure that the work and the effort that's being done is actually having a real, a real impact and the impact that we expected. So this data and this information I think is fantastic and I also like that we as a, the public when we have these public conversations, the, the public can know that the data that we're working with here is the same thing that's used to, to improve in the building. I think that's one thing that we just felt a little bit disconnected from. Um, we knew we were looking at it in the aggregate, but we always felt like people were using different pieces of data here and there because they mattered more in the classroom. And I think now knowing that we're all on the same page um, is something that makes me feel really good about this. So uh, I, I think it's fantastic work. Thank you. Anybody else have a comment, question? Great work, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you so, so much for that work, Justin. Mm -hmm. It was easy, right? <laughs> <laughs> it was, it's, it's good to be here. <laughs> <laughs> that was very diplomatic, Justin. <laughs> All right, this is now an opportunity for members of the audience to share public comment with the board, but it's not intended to be a time for members of the public to enter into a dialogue with the board. Issues raised during public comment may be added to future agendas or addressed by administrative staff as appropriate. I have a lot of 30 minutes. I have no um, public comment cards at this time. Uh, I will do one last call. Is there anyone that would like to make a public comment? Okay. Then uh, we're up to our approval of minutes. Are there any suggested revisions to the minutes as presented in the packet of materials? All right. If not, is there a motion to approve the minutes for the April 11th, 2022 regular meeting as presented? So moved. Second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the motion carried to approve the minutes of the April 11th, 2022 regular meeting as presented. All right, we have our consent agenda tonight. Are there any items a board member would like to have considered separately? All right, if not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report and financial statements consisting of the list of bills and the summary? So moved. Second. All right, Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet of materials. All right. I have four items uh, tonight up for recommendation. The first one is the Indian Trail Playground fundraising. Is there a motion to approve the fundraising plan for the Indian Trail community for improving the playground areas at their school? So moved. moved. Second. All right. Any discussion? I think we do have uh, Kevin here with. Uh, Parent from Indian Trail. Awesome. Welcome. Good evening. I'd like to uh, welcome Jen Spock from Indian Trail Playground Committee to attend tonight's meeting. So uh, I've been working with the Indian Trail group just to um, support and help them as they raise additional dollars for their projects. We would appreciate your uh, confirmation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, I just want to say thank you. Kevin, for your partnership on this. We have a very eager and excited group of parents really wanting to bring something great to our school and to our kids. So appreciate the support. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you for Wonderful. being here. Remember the first, I remember the first board meeting or PTA meeting I went to as a board member with Greg. Yep. And the plate, and that was several, 2019. That was the number one question that came up at the PTA meeting. So yay. <laughs> <laughs> Forward movement. Progress. I have a group of students at Indian Trail who wrote me very passionate letters about why they need a new playground. So I'm very excited to get back in front of that class with the yeah. community. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, the motion carried to approve the fundraising plan uh, by the Indian Trail community for improving the playground areas at their school. 
Next, we have a switch and firewall purchase. Is there a motion to approve the purchase of 36 Cisco switches, the associated Cisco accessories and licenses, and a sonic wall security appliance, and the associated high availability security appliance for a cost of $164,060 from Sentinel? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the purchase of 36 Cisco switches, the associated Cisco accessories and licenses, a sonic wall security appliance, and the associated high availability security appliance for a total cost of $164,060 from Sentinel. Is there a motion to approve the purchase of 3,760 perpetual JAMP school licenses from JAMP for a cost of $65,800? So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the purchase of 3,760 perpetual JAMP school licenses for, from JAMP for a total cost of $65,800. Last up is uh, Seesaw for Schools contract renewal. Is there a motion to approve a three-year contract renewal for Seesaw for Schools for a total cost of $60,750? So moved. Second. Okay. All right. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve a three-year contract for Seesaw for Schools for a total cost of $60,750. A couple of announcements. Uh, on Tuesday, May 10th at 3.30 p.m., uh, the Parent Teacher Advisory Committee uh, will meet virtually. Okay. That, this one will... All right, and then on Monday, May 16th at 3.45 p.m., the district leadership team will meet at O'Neill Middle School. Tuesday, May 25th at 7 a.m. will be the policy committee meeting at Herrick Middle School. Friday, June 10th at 7 a.m. will be the next uh, financial advisory committee meeting at O'Neill Middle School. And then Monday, June 13th at 7 p.m. will be our next regular boarding board meeting right here at Village Hall. All right, the board will now meet in closed session. Is there a motion to move to closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the district? That's 5 ILCS 122C1. And a collective negotiating matters between the public body and its employees or representatives or deliberations uh, concerning salary schedules for one or more classes of employees. That's 5 ILCS 122C2. So moved. Second. Second. All right, any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The board will now move into closed session after a short recess. Let's meet at 840.